This portrait of Mark Brunel, painted around 1813, is from the National Portrait Gallery. This is quite an achievement for a French-born American citizen. A clue to why this is lies in the background of this painting, a model of his greatest achievement up to that point, a block-making machine. This was one of a number of machines Mark invented that pioneered industrial production. They were designed for Portsmouth Dockyard to make pulley blocks for ships. And this Frenchman played a crucial role in the defeat of French and Spanish navies at the Battle of Trafalgar. Mark had one of the most original minds in the history of engineering, and his inspiration could come from anywhere. For instance, while he was installing a sawmill in Chatham Dockyard, he came across an old timber eaten away by shipworm, Teredo navalis. Studying the animal more closely, he saw how it was able to chew through the wood and fill the hole it was making completely with its body, stopping the hole collapsing in the process. This sparked Mark's imagination and provided the answer to tunnelling under a river where the weight of water above meant there was always the danger of tunnel collapse. The answer? You chew through the ground and fill up the space immediately. Every previous attempt at tunnelling under a river had used the traditional miner's technique of digging a small tunnel, called a driftway, and then expanding it. But, as this early drawing shows, Mark was thinking of creating a circular tunnel like the one created by the shipworm, or rather two tunnels side by side. Instead of the worm's jaws, there would be an iron shield in which the miners stood and hacked through the soil. Behind them, the exposed soil was to be held back with cast iron plates, which would then be strengthened with brickwork. Mark took out a patent in 1818 for a method of digging a tunnel. It didn't take him long to realise that a circular tunnel face could not accommodate many miners, so he began to develop plans for the two tunnels linked through a third tunnel. The circular tunnels were replaced by graceful arch ones instead. Gone too was the cast iron lining, replaced by thick brickwork. The next step in Mark's thinking was to dispense with the three shields and to create a single large rectangular shield, which the bricklayers would form into two tunnels, pierced by open arches. This meant that both tunnels could be lit from lights placed in the arcades. Mark realised the commercial success of the tunnel relied on coaches and carts being able to use it but sadly, he could never raise the money for the long ramps needed to get horse-drawn traffic down to the entrance. Yet Mark did succeed in designing and building the world's first underwater tunnel, and these drawings, now in our possession, show just how he planned it.